We'll open our Bibles this evening to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 will be our key text, and then we'll go to several other passages tonight as we are working through uh, the message. But I do want to start here in Romans chapter 1, and we are going to be continuing to ask the question tonight, as it's put up here on the board behind me, Christ, whose son is he? And i got a number of uh, answers to that question that we want to look at, and right now we're considering the, uh, the first matter, the first answer to that question, and we said that Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And so the last couple of weeks we have been looking at the various aspects of it, and uh, certainly that's a, that's a title that uh, has a lot, of, a lot of meat to it, so to speak. And uh, that's why we're spending several messages looking at this. I don't necessarily anticipate that each one of the, the answers that we went over in the first message uh, are going to take this many lessons to work through, but uh, the Son of God is uh, certainly a title of Christ that has a lot of meat on the bone for us to consider, and uh, much more so even than what we're looking at, but uh, I felt like it was important to spend a little bit of time on this one in particular and try to appreciate it uh, for, for some of the things that uh, it, it conveys uh, concerning Christ, the Son of God. And so, Along those lines, as I've said, the last couple of messages, we have been considering that title, and we've looked at it from two aspects thus far. And uh, the first week that we were considering it, we looked at the issue of the fact that he's the Son of God by his conception and birth. And we talked a little bit about the, the virgin conception and birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fact that he came and was deity incarnate, right? And it was a holy thing that was born of Mary there without the, the intervention of sinful man, but the Holy Ghost came upon the, the womb of the Virgin, and the Son of God was conceived, therefore, in her womb and came into the world uh, without that sin nature that we all possess by our father Adam. And so he is the Son of God by his conception and birth as deity incarnate. And then we said, secondly, and last week we looked at the issue of his election. He's the Son of God by election. And we talked about his sonship and what he was chosen of God the Father to do and what he came to be as the perfect servant of the Lord. And uh, talked about that last week. And then one final aspect of the title, the Son of God, that we want to consider is the fact that he's the Son of God by his resurrection. Okay, and so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, the issue of the resurrection. Now, of course, when we talk about the resurrection of Christ, right, that's a monumental event. Uh, that's an issue of uh, chief importance uh, when it comes to our faith and the doctrine that we believe and the validity of it. And the reason that we would have to put faith in Jesus Christ, right? It's the issue that after having died for our sins and being buried, he was raised again the third day according to the scripture. Right? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection, of course, validates and verifies uh, both of these previous two points. Right? It would be one thing to say that he was the virgin-born son of God, but yet if he dies and he stays in the grave, then you know all that claim about him being deity in flesh really kind of goes out the window. Uh, and his resurrection also validates the fact that in his sonship, he did function in perfect obedience to the Father, right? And that his ministry and, and what he went about to do was uh, authorized by God and that he, he's, he's shown to be who he is by the resurrection. And so certainly the resurrection validates and verifies both of the previous two points. Uh, but I, I think that uh, in the resurrection, uh, we also see that the resurrection is a, a, a doorway, so to speak, that he, he goes through in an in a area of the Father's purpose in which, in connection with the fact that he's raised from the dead, some things get bestowed upon him as the Son of God in connection with that that uh, were not in place uh, prior to that. And so that has some significance and uh, some things that we need to look at. And it shows really that Christ is the rightful possessor of some things as the Son of God. Right? Not just that he possesses them and that he has an inheritance from the Father, by virtue of the fact that he's God the Son, but in his resurrection, there's something that's declared about him in connection with who he is as the Son of God that, that uh, some things accrue to him by that resurrection, right? Some things that he receives and that he purchases and that he's given power and authority in connection with in relation to the resurrection. And I think that you can see that here in Romans chapter 1 as uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Romans and he says some things about the resurrection of Christ. And so uh, we're going to look at the opening verses here of Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. 
which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Amen. Now, as Paul gets underway here in Romans, you can see that he's setting forth his theme. All right? he's, he's, his theme is set forth as the gospel of God. And he says, I've been separated under that gospel of God. Uh, the gospel of God really is a term that is kind of a, a broad umbrella term, so to speak, that encompasses the, the whole of God's redemptive purpose in Christ. Okay, you know that because Paul explains what he's talking about there in verse 3 after he, he gave the parenthesis in verse 2 and talks about what was promised by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, but still describing that gospel of God that he left off with at the end of verse 1, he said that this gospel of God, it's concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right? He's, he's talking about the, the really the, the umbrella collective term of what God purposed to do redemptively in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's been separated in connection with the ministry related to that and, uh, and the, the redemption purpose of God and to make some things manifest in relation to that. And he says that the, uh, the Son of God, um, so, so, so the things there that have happened in relation to the Son of God and God's redemptive purpose in Christ. Now after he declares that, he goes on to give a summary of what concerns Jesus Christ. And so he says the gospel of God concerns his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, but then he gives a summary of, of how that's come to be. And he talks about really how that he was incarnate as, as God in human flesh. He says that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Right? That's how that God came down and, and took upon him the seed of David. Right? The son of David is one of those topics that we'll be talking about in this series later on. But he, God literally, Jehovah literally, enfleshed himself in David's seed line and came as a man. According to the flesh, he came in the seed of David. And, of course, we know that he was made a man for the purpose of the suffering of death. Right? He, he came to taste death for every man, Hebrews chapter 2 says. And so he comes and he fulfills that and he does that. And then after having died for the atonement of sin, the third day, Jesus Christ is raised from the dead victorious. Right? And he summarizes that for you there as he's explaining what's involved in this gospel of God he's separated uh, in connection with. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now he says that in relation to the resurrection that there is um, uh, there's a, um, a declaration that's made concerning him. As it relates to the resurrection. A declaration of God the Father with respect to the redemption work that he's accomplished. What he came, made in the seed line of David to perform. He's gone and performed and he died having made the atonement. God's raised him up from the dead, and in connection with that resurrection, God makes a declaration concerning his son. And that's what Paul's pointing at here in verse 4, when he says that in, he was declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Right, so there's a declaration that's made concerning the son in his, uh, in his resurrection there. He's declared to be the son of God with power. And concerning the resurrection. Now, when he says he's declared to be the Son of God with power, you have to ask yourself, what power is he talking about there? Right? What, what power is it that Jesus Christ is declared to be the Son of God in connection with? Well, the verse explains that it's the power that's according to the spirit of holiness. Well, what's the spirit of holiness, right? Well, that reaches back to some of those things that were talked about in the Holy Scriptures by the prophets, as he was talking about in verse 2. And he's really referencing there the spiritual things of that New Testament. Uh, what the blood of the New Testament that was shed was, what it was shed to provide. And that, of course, is the benefits of the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Right? He purchased the benefits of the New Testament and what it talked about. And the need of man for spiritual fitness, perfect justification and perfect sanctification, resident in the redemption which is in Christ Jesus through faith in his blood. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says that by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So in the shedding of his blood, there's eternal redemption that was purchased. Amen. Some benefits of redemption that, that are, uh, are, are for us through what he shed there. And it was by the blood that he shed there that atonement was made. 
And in connection with the atonement and the success of, of what he offered there and the acceptance of what he offered there through the shedding of his blood to God the Father, when he's resurrected, it says that he was declared to be the Son of God with power in connection with that. The Son of God with power, therefore, to bestow the benefits of that redemption which he's just bought with his own blood. He's the Redeemer. He can give perfect justification. He can give perfect sanctification to those that come unto him because of what he's purchased there and the atoning work of his death there on the cross. And so there's some power, therefore, that's vested in the Lord Jesus Christ in connection with that resurrection. Uh, there were some things that were given to him and bestowed upon him and, and declared of him by God the Father in connection with what he successfully uh, performed in his redemption work, some things that he obtained as a direct result of what he faithfully performed. And the Father declares that, and he bestows that upon his Son there in relation to the resurrection. Now, it's true that Jesus Christ was eternal God and one with the Father from eternity past, right? We know that. He was the Son of God from eternity past in terms of his deity and who he was, one with the Father. And we're not saying that, you know, the resurrection makes him God. Right? He was God long before that from eternity past. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah. Right? And so nothing to do with the resurrection makes him God. He was that from everlasting. Right? He is he which is and which was and which is to come. He's the Almighty God, the everlasting one. And we understand that. It's true also that Jesus Christ was the Son of God in connection with his work that the Father gave him to do during his earthly ministry. We said that he was the chosen Son in whom the Father was well pleased. Mm -hmm. right? The Father made that declaration of him. He was the Son that did always those things that pleased the Father. John 8, 29. He was the one who he said, I came not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, 38. He lived in perfect obedience to the Father's will. The perfect servant. Jehovah's elect, the Son of God. He was all of that before he ever went to the cross. Amen. Right? He was God in the flesh during his ministry. He was perfectly obedient during his ministry. Before he ever went to the cross and was raised again, he was the Son of God in connection with those things. Amen. Eternal God and perfect servant yet having not gone to the cross. He was all of those things. And those things are extremely important in making it so that the cross would be meaningful to God's intended end. Right? Just going to the cross in and of itself doesn't mean anything if he's not qualified to perform the work of redemption. Right? He has to be God in human flesh, the, the second man, as it were, not having the, the, the predicament that Adam and his race are in concerning the sin nature and the fall. He has to fulfill the righteous demands of the law to provide for the righteousness. And he does that through perfect obedience to the Father. All of that's true and all of that's necessary so that the cross can mean something. But it's also very important to realize that the benefits of the redemption were not purchased by the fact simply that Jesus Christ took on flesh. Right? We don't have redemption today just because Jesus Christ came into the world as a babe born lying in a manger. Right? The babe born and lying in the manger is not why we have redemption today. Right. Likewise, the benefits of redemption were not purchased by the fact that he lived a faithful life in perfect obedience to the Father. Right? His earthly ministry with all of its miracles and its wonders and all the glorious things that he did while he walked this earth, those things, you realize, do not save us. Those things do not redeem us. They're essential. They're necessary. But there's no redemption in those things. No, the benefits of redemption were purchased by the fact that Jesus Christ one day marched up the top of Mount Calvary. And he bled there and he died there for the sins of the world, giving himself a ransom for all. It's in the shedding of his blood, the blood of the New Testament, the blood that provides for that spirit of holiness. It's in that work of redemption, in his death and his burial and his resurrection that we have the benefits of redemption purchased. And it's through what he did there that God the Father signed, so to speak, with a, a seal of approval on what he offered there by the fact that he raised him up from the dead. And in connection with that, he declared that this one who's performed that work of redemption, he is the Son of God, but now with power to bestow the benefits of redemption. And he declares that by the resurrection of the dead, he says. It's his sacrifice. And what God declares of him on the basis of that sacrifice, what he has the power to give and to bestow all that come unto him, 
on the basis of what he did there that we find the benefits of righteousness. And he's got the power now to bestow the gift of righteousness and the gift of eternal life on the basis of what he performed. Amen. That's the power he's talking about. That's glorious, is it not? And to think about that, the gloriousness of, of that gospel and the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ and how that he offered himself up without spot to God. What a gospel that is. Amen. And to think that God would, would humble himself, as Philippians chapter 2 says, all the way from the exalted position in the height of glory, all the way down, not only to take on him the form of a man, but to go to the cross and, and to die that worst kind of death, even the death of the cross, to redeem unworthy sinners. On the basis of his blood. It's a glorious gospel. And what I want us to see in that is not only the glory of that gospel of God and the redemptive work that he purposed in his son. But also the fact that in the resurrection, Jesus Christ became the possessor and the heir of some things that were not his prior to that. Redemptively speaking. Now, you realize all things are his by creation. Right? By him were all things created. God owns it all in the sense of creation, but prior to the fact of him shedding his blood and being raised again from the dead, there were some things that were not, not present there that he didn't possess on the basis of redemption until that work was accomplished. And some things come to him, right? There, there's some power that comes to him in the declaration of the Father in connection with his resurrection. Some things he's given some power to do and to bestow on the basis that he has redeemed or performed the work of redemption and raised again from the dead. He's getting some things there from the Father. He's becoming the heir of some things, redemptively speaking. And it's there that the, the, the Apostle Paul says that he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. He's the Son of God, therefore, by his resurrection. Now, what does that mean? What, what does that entail? Grab two passages with me now, if you will. Let's go to Psalm 2, and also go ahead and find Acts chapter 13. Second Psalm and Acts 13 will be in Psalm 2 first. And I want to show you these couple of passages here, and we'll start with Psalms, as I said. And Psalm 2 is really a significant psalm in relation to things that are taking place and the end of the gospel period, and especially in early Acts, and really on into the, the rest of the, the prophetic timeline, and the day of the Lord, and the kingdom, and so on. Uh, it's, a, it's a significant psalm in relation to that. And actually, verses uh, 1 through 6 of this psalm kind of outline what takes place in Israel's program from the time where Messiah is rejected. Uh, you'll see that it's after he's in absence, sitting in heaven the day of the Lord, and then finally establishing of the kingdom. And the second psalm kind of encapsulates all of that. And uh, verse 7 is what I'm trying to get to, but I, I want to start reading in verse 1 so that you can kind of see the sequence of things that he's, he's building up, up to and kind of understand the significance of what's going on here. Uh, but it's, it's outlining those um, final things of Israel's program, so to speak, ending up with him in the kingdom. But look here in uh, Psalm 2, verse 1. The psalmist says, Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Kind of see the sequence of things he's building up there? Right? It just starts back up in the beginning of the, the psalm there where you've got the heathen and the people coming together and they're raging and imagining a vain thing against the Lord. They've, they've set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed, against his Christ, the rejection of the Messiah. Their, their words is, you know, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Total repudiation and rejection of the Father and the Son. You see in verse 4 that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ there would be sitting in the heavens. Right? He goes back to the heavens. He's absent there for a time, especially there in that early Acts period as repentance is being offered to Israel. All right? And there's the, the, the sitting in the heavens there, and they, they're still opposing the testimony of Jesus 
And then according to prophecy, what comes following that there is the day of the Lord's wrath where he speaks to them in his wrath and he vexes them in his sore displeasure. Right, The day of the Lord and the judging wrath of God. And then after the wrath, verse 6, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And he's established there in the kingdom. Right, He returns, he establishes the kingdom, and he's ruling there as the king of kings and the lord of lords. And so he's really taking you through the progression of... of of uh, what's going on there. And, and as you're following the sequence of that, what you're seeing is that the issue of him setting upon his holy hill of Zion, the kingdom, so to speak, that, that reigning and that glory that ultimately comes to him, it, it all flows out of what took place back in his rejection and his humiliation. Right? When they're saying, you know, let's cast away their cords from us. Break their bands asunder. We'll not have this man to, to rule over us. Rejection of the Messiah... That ultimately Israel takes and by wicked hands they crucify and slay there on the cross. Right? They reject him. But out of that rejection and that humiliation he's exalted to the Father's right hand in the heavens. He's given the authority to execute the Lord's day. And ultimately he sits on that holy hill of Zion that's been given to him. Right? He's receiving an inheritance therefore that flows out of the rejection. Out of the humiliation. Out of the suffering. The shedding of his blood and what he does there on the cross, out of that comes an inheritance where he's sitting upon that holy hill in his kingdom. Now, you take that thought and you look at verse 7 there of the second psalm, Psalm 2 7, and he kind of goes back, and the psalmist is going to kind of go through that again and, and summarize it for you again. And uh, he does that beginning at verse 7, and I want you to pay special attention to the terminology that the psalmist uses here in relation to uh, the, the Christ and what he's going to do. So Psalm 2 and verse number 7. Psalm 2, 7, he says, I will declare the decree. Right? There's a declaration that's going on here, right? I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Mm -hmm. right? So, there's a declaration that the Father's making of the Son here, right? The Lord is making it of Christ the King. The Lord's making a declaration concerning the one that he's going to set upon that holy hill there. And he says that the declaration is that thou art my Son. Thou art my Son. Now, if you're thinking about that and relating it back to where we started, Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul said something about a declaration. That would be made. Right? Paul said in Romans 1.4 that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God. Right? He's declared to be the Son of God. Well, Psalm 2.7 says that the Lord's going to declare the decree and say, Thou art my Son. Declaration of Him, that He's the Son. Amen. You notice that this declaration is taking place on a specific day. It's not just, Thou art my Son, but He continues. Right? Thou art my Son this day. This day have I begotten thee. Now what day is the Lord talking about? Where that declaration that he's the son is going to be made. Well, if you're right, Romans 1, if you're thinking about what Paul said, you probably got a good guess about that. Paul said that he was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by what? The resurrection of the dead. Right? The resurrection. The day of the resurrection. That's what you would understand from Paul. A declaration being made in, his, in regard and in connection with his resurrection. Now, hold your place here. We're coming back to Psalm 2, but look at Acts 13. I'm just going to show you another passage here that confirms that this day that he's talking about is, in fact, a reference to the resurrection of Christ. Acts chapter 13. And what's taking place here in Acts 13 is that Paul is preaching in the synagogue of the Jews in Antioch in Pisidia. And as you read through the entirety of the chapter here, you'll see that Paul uh, kind of summarizes the history of the Jews up to the point of King David. And then from David, he jumps to preach Christ the Savior to them. Okay, And so he does that, and he, he talks about how the, the Jews had unwittingly fulfilled what was written of Christ and his sufferings, and that they rejected him and crucified him on the cross. And then he comes down to about verse 32 here, and he says this. Right? So Acts 13, 32. He says, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that 
He hath raised up Jesus again. Right? He's already said that he died and that, that, that issue of them uh, crucifying him. But he's saying here that God has fulfilled his promise in the fact that he has raised up Jesus again. Right? The resurrection of Christ is a fulfillment of the promise of God. Right? That's what he said in Romans 1 as well. Now watch this. In connection with that resurrection, that fulfilled promise of Jesus being raised, he said, as it is also written in the second psalm. All right, so Paul's about to tell you what day Psalm 2 7 is talking about. Right, and he's tying that to the resurrection. And he quotes it there. He says, As it's written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said, On this wise I will give you the sure mercies of David. Now, verse 33 is telling you. What Psalm 2-7 is in reference to. Right? If there was any doubt about it, if there was any confusion about it, when you do the cross-reference and you look at what Paul says in Acts 13, he says that the raising up of Jesus from the dead is according to what was written in the second psalm. And he specifically says, what I'm talking about in that second psalm is the verse that says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Amen. Right? So there's a declaration concerning the son that takes place on the day of the resurrection. All right, And in connection with the declaration that the Father's making, what comes out of that is an inheritance that's given to the Son. There, there's some power and some possession that comes to the Son. As he goes on to say there in verse 34, As concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. All right? See, there's something that comes out of it. He says, I will give you something. <laughs> You see, on the basis of Psalm 2-7 being fulfilled and the declaration that the Father's being made on his resurrection, that thou art my son, in connection with that declaration that he is the son of God, there's something that I'm going to give him in connection with that. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm going to give him the sure mercies of David. Now, the sure mercies of David are talked about in Isaiah 55. We're not going to go read that, but if you go back and you look there, Isaiah 55, when he talks about those sure mercies of David, what that's given in connection with is the availability of free salvation and an everlasting covenant that results in the Davidic covenant being established and the Davidic kingdom being established with Israel. Right? Free salvation and the establishment of the kingdom. The reward or the inheritance of of the kingdom flows out of what was performed and what provided for the free salvation that he's now got the power to bestow. Right? What Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 1 there, when he's declared to be the son of God with power, right? the power to give the benefits of that free salvation, specifically in that context, on behalf of the people of Israel, for their spiritual fitness, to make them spiritually fit to be used by the Lord, so that they can go into that land and inherit that kingdom and reign with Christ in his kingdom. Out of the sufferings of the Messiah comes the reward and the inheritance and the power. Right? And that's given to him. When he's raised up from the dead, this is my son, this day have I begotten thee. He's the son of God with power. Power to give free salvation and also the inheritance of that everlasting covenant concerning the Davidic kingdom for Israel. And so what you're seeing once again is that this inheritance that he receives in relation to his declaration as the Son of God is, is tied to what takes place on the day of his resurrection. Now, if you go back to Psalm 2, hopefully you held your place there, you see this same pattern developing again. Now, we already established it in the first part of the psalm, starting in rejection and ending in him sitting upon his holy hill of Zion. But the same thing happens as you transition into verse 8. Right? Verse 7, he's just made the declaration, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. But look at what verse 8 says, right? in relation to what he's given in that resurrection. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. See, It's when he's declaring him to be the son of God. He says, I, there, there's some things I'm going to give you. Ask of me, I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance. I'll give you the uttermost part of the earth for your possession. Some things come into his possession. 
He's, he's given some things by the Father. He receives an inheritance from the Father on the basis of what he did in the redemption. When he's raised up from the dead, you're the son to whom I'm going to bestow these things and give these things. You're the son of God. And that comes with power and inheritance and glory and honor and blessing unto him. That one's the son by the resurrection of the dead. Right? The one that was raised up from the dead is who the Lord says I'm going to give those things to. Mm -hmm. right? It's that same pattern that you see that because of what he performed in the redemption, what comes in connection with that is that power and authority and inheritance to reign. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Another passage where you're going to see the same pattern established. All right? Let's look here at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. Hebrews 1, 1. You got it? Yeah. All right. He says in verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Right, by his Son. Mm -hmm. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Right? So the writer to the Hebrews here says that the Son has spoken to Israel, right? He talked about the fathers in verse 1. He's talking about the fathers of the Hebrews, spoken unto them by the prophets. But he says in these last days, he's spoken unto us by his Son. Right? The Son came, made of the seed of David. He had a ministry. He spoke the word of God to Israel and he had spoken unto them. And then he says that after he had spoken unto them in the glory of his person, verse, the end of verse 3 there, that when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. All right, so not only has he spoken to the Hebrews, but at this point where he's talking about it, Christ has already gone back to the Father. Now he's gone back up there. After he's purged him by his own blood, right? He shed the blood for the atonement. And he's gone back to the Father. And he sat down there at the Father's right hand. All right, so that tells you that at this point, the ministry is fulfilled. Obviously, the death has been died and the blood has been shed. Because he's got that purging that he talks about there by his own blood. And now he's back at the Father's right hand. And so that also entails the fact that not only did he die, and not only did he sit at the Father's right hand, but in between those two things, what else also had to happen? Had to be raised up. Amen. Right? He died, raised up, exalted to the Father's right hand, sits down there. Right? So that work that we're talking about, the humiliation and the rejection, has been performed. Right? Now watch this. Out of that, right, out of that rejection... Out of that redemption work, verse 4, he says, being made so much better than the angels. Now, later on, I think it's chapter 2, he'll say that we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Right? Not in the sense of him not being God. Of course, as God, he's above the angels. But in taking on the form of man, man's a little lower than the angels. He took that upon himself for the purpose of the suffering of death. Going to perform the redemption. All right? But now, on the basis of that being performed, and him having risen from the dead and exalted to the Father's right hand, he's been made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. All right? Not just a more excellent name in the sense that he's God, but something that he has obtained by inheritance. Something that has been given to him, a power that he has secured to himself through the redemption. He has received a more excellent name than they by inheritance, he says. Now, how do you know that? He says, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. 
And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels uh, spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. What do you see in here, right? There's a pattern of what takes place in the redemption. What is declared about him in connection with the resurrection, that thou art my son in relation to that. There's some things that accrue to him because of that. Some power and honor and blessing that comes to him because he's declared to be that son of God with power. And there's a whole lot of things that we just read through there that are awesome to understand in relation to what the father's giving him because of what he's done. He's been given the angelic dispatch. All the angels of God worship him. He's been given the command of the heavenly host for the execution of the Lord's day. And he says that his throne is going to be established forever. He's going to give him that throne and have him established there. And he's going to reign in glory and power. But it all goes back to what he performed in the redemption that makes it all possible. And the declaration of the Father on the basis of that, that you are my son by that resurrection. He says he's got a better name. He, he's telling the Hebrews, this is why you better hear the son. Yeah, hear right? that, that's his whole point in the context of what he's dealing with there. You better hear the son. Yeah. Right? The one the Hebrews crucified by wicked hands and slew him and rejected him. You better hear him. Because of what's been given to him by the father. He's not coming again as that lamb to the slaughter. Oh, no. He's coming as the lion of Judah. Yeah. To execute wrath and vengeance upon his enemies. And he's saying, you better hear the son and get out of the camp of his enemies and get in the camp of those that believe on him. Hear him. He's been declared to be the son of God with power. He's the one with the command of those mighty angels that will execute the vengeance of the revelation. He's the one that will come having vanquished his foes and sit upon that throne in a kingdom forever. Thy throne, O God, is forever. He says that to the son. It's a connection with what the father declares of him. That ought to stir you up, folks. <laughs> I'm talking about the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Right? The son of God. Now, one more point on this. And we'll, we'll leave this one here and move on to some other stuff in the weeks to come. But. I'm just trying to establish for you the, the pattern, and hopefully you've seen that pattern where suffering leads to glory, right? That's what he tells the, uh, the disciples, of, is it the disciples on the Emmaus Road after his resurrection? When they're downtrodden and in, in, in despair about that. He says, ought not Christ to have suffered and entered into his glory? Right? Suffering comes first, but out of suffering comes the glory of the kingdom. That's the pattern you see over and over and over again. But look at something else he says here. And I, I could easily take you back to Psalms 2 to show you this. But we're here in Hebrews 1 and we've got the verse in verse 5 there from the second Psalm. So we'll just use this uh, to make the point here. Look at what he says here as he's quoting Psalm 2, 7. He says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, and here's the quote, Thou art my son, this day... Have I begotten thee? This day have I begotten thee. Yeah. Now, if you didn't know better already, and you do know better already, because I've already told you what day he's talking about, but if you didn't know better already, when you see the word begotten, you might think, well, he's talking about his birth, yeah, his birth the fact that God came into the world, right? He's the son of God by birth, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Maybe he's talking about that issue of Christ coming into the world as the babe lying in a manger. Right? That'd be a, a way that you could default to thinking, so to speak, based on the terminology. We usually think of the word begotten in that sense. And certainly, uh, Christ was begotten of God, right? In connection with him coming into the world, God manifest in the flesh. He's sometimes called the only begotten of God, mm -hmm. right? John 3, 16 is that, that probably classic example of that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He came as the only begotten son. Right? By conception and by birth he was begotten of God. And he's the son of God in relation to that. 
But in terms of resurrection, we know this is resurrection. Begotten there is a term that it's not talking about him being begotten as a man coming into the world, but really as one who's begotten from the dead to an everlasting life. Right? Begotten from the dead to life everlasting. No more to turn to corruption, as Acts 13 says. Right? He's, um, he's begotten to an endless life. I think Hebrews describes it in one place. That's the context of what he's talking about. Begotten to, uh, from death to an endless life. An everlasting life. Now, what's interesting about uh, that, and, and sometimes you'll see, and I, I should make the point before I move on there, I, I said that in terms of his incarnation as humanity, he's called the only begotten son. But when he's talking about begotten from the dead or resurrection, a lot of the time the way that you'll see that is in terms of the first begotten. Right? Only begotten here, first begotten here with the resurrection. Or sometimes he'll use the term firstborn from the dead. Right? That, that's all tied up in the, the resurrection in the sense, the way that that's, uh, that's described. Uh, we actually saw it here in Hebrews 1 and verse... Uh, six, right? Uh, after he's made that quote about uh, this day have I begotten thee, in verse six he said, uh, and again when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Again, that's not talking about his birth, that's talking about the resurrection. Right? He went out of the world in death, but he brings the first begotten into the world, and in connection with the declaration that he's the son of God with power, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Right? He's given the charge of the angelic dispatch for the execution of his day, right? But he's called the first begotten there. Uh, when you get into Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, John says that it's from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Right? That, that's significant in view of what Revelation is about, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ him coming in power and great glory and the establishment of the kingdom. That's on the basis that he's the first begotten from the dead, right? That declaration as the Son of God with power, the first begotten. In Colossians 1.18, Paul said that he's the head of the body, the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Right? So first begotten and firstborn are oftentimes used in connection with of the dead or from the dead in relation to his resurrection. Now, it's interesting that when you study the concept of the first begotten or the firstborn in Scripture, that very often that's tied to the issue of a birthright. Right? The firstborn is the birthright. And that, of course, involves a blessing. It involves inheritance, right? Uh, a portion that would be greater in the inheritance from the Father that you have by reason of birthright. Uh, of course, there's plenty of examples to consider about that in relation to Genesis. When you go back there, it talks about the birthright. And, you know, probably uh, Esau and Jacob's one that comes to mind, how that Esau was the firstborn and had right to the birthright, but he sold it for a uh, bowl of pottage. Right? Sold the birthright and all that goes into that. And there's ex other examples in Genesis that talk about the firstborn and the birthright. And uh, you can study that out on your own. But I will just remind you in relation to that concept of something that we talked about last week, actually, in relation to Israel, the nation. Right? In Exodus chapter 4, when God sends Moses down there to Pharaoh and he gives him instruction to give Pharaoh the message. In, in uh, Exodus 4... In verse 22, we read this last week, it said, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Like, not just my son, but my firstborn son. And the reason he's calling him that is because there's an issue of inheritance and blessing that's wrapped up in that. Israel's the chosen nation. That's Jehovah's nation. I told you last week that God went down there uh, by Moses to, uh, to Egypt with Pharaoh and he gives the command to let my people go, but it's not just to get them out of Egypt. God, God's going to do some things there in Egypt to declare his name in all the earth, he says back there. But it's not just about getting them out from underneath the, the taskmasters and the cruel bondage and, and making their life better. Right? He's not going to bring them out there in the wilderness. And he, his will for them is not for them to wander around for 40 years. They end up doing that to themselves through unbelief. His will, and he declares it so, I'm bringing you out in order to take you in. I'm going to take you to the land promised to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you're going to be unto me a peculiar treasure. 
Above all people, all the earth is mine. You are my chosen in connection with my purpose in the earth. I'm going to plant you there, and I'm going to use you as that special nation, my kingdom of priests and holy nation, and through you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. I'm going to bless you, and the overflow of your blessings are going to go out to them. They're the ones with the birthright, so to speak. They're the ones with the inheritance. They're the ones to whom pertaineth the glory and the promises and the covenants and the use of God as his son nation, even the firstborn. They're the ones that have claim to that inheritance and, and that blessing and honor and glory. And he says that Israel's my son, even my firstborn. Now, you take that understanding of relationship and you go to Psalm 89. And I'll show you another verse that kind of weaves all these concepts together that we're looking at. 89th Psalm. This is a psalm that's extolling the faithfulness of the Lord in connection with the Davidic covenant specifically. And of course the outcome of the Davidic covenant is the kingdom and all those issues of Israel's inheritance and uh, all made possible, of course, by the greater king, the Messiah, who would come and fulfill it. And uh, David, of course, is a type of Christ. And uh, we've already heard something about the sure mercies of David tonight in Acts chapter 13 in relation to that kingdom and everlasting covenant. And you kind of see those issues coming up again here if you look in Psalm 89. And uh, let's begin in verse 20. Psalm 89, 20. He says, I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness, look at this now, and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. And I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Watch verse 27 now. He says, And I, or also I will make him my firstborn. My firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. You see some sure mercies of David talked about there? Yeah. Right, some sure mercies of David. Some things that he said, my hand's going to be established with, that I'm going to give unto him. I'll beat back his enemies. I'll establish his throne. Some sure mercies that are given to David there. The inheritance of power and possession and a kingdom. He's going to be the firstborn higher than the kings of the earth, he says. There's blessing and inheritance of that. And of course, all of that is fulfilled through the son of David that's coming. Jesus Christ, who's made of the seed of David according to the flesh. The one who will be declared to be the son of God with power. He's made that firstborn, he says, higher than the kings of the earth. It's the inheritance of Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords tied to the issue of the fact that he is the firstborn. Inheritance. He's got the birthright of the kingdom. The heir of all things in connection with that declaration that thou art my son. This day, the resurrection day, have I begotten thee. And again, that's why he's called the first begotten from the dead in Revelation chapter 1. Right, the book that's devoted to showing how that he is now ready to come and to take possession of what's rightfully his. What's been given to him by the Father uh, through inheritance, the Son now is, is ready to begin to, to reveal and to pour out his wrath and ultimately to establish that kingdom. And connection with that, Revelation chapter 1 declares him to be the first begotten from the dead. Right, the one that's going to be the firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. The King of kings and the Lord of lords reigning in the midst of his enemies. And so what we learn in that is he is the son of God by virtue of his resurrection. He's going to be exalted. There's going to be glory for him being exalted over all of the kings. Right? The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's his inheritance. That's the power that's being given to him in connection with the fact that he's the son of God by his resurrection. 
And the matter actually goes a little deeper than that because in Romans chapter 1, where we started this whole thing, you remember that Paul said in Romans 1.1 1, 1, that he had been separated. He said, I've been separated unto the gospel of God. I've been separated in connection with some good news of God concerning Christ and the fact uh, that is related to the, his resurrection and the fact that he was declared to be the Son of God with power. I've been separated in relation to something that God wants to make known about that. And, and what's been made manifest through Paul is that that redemption work that Christ performed on the cross that was sealed by his resurrection and the, the, the seal of the Father was upon it by the resurrection. It actually spelled out more of inheritance for the Son than was even known to prophecy. That's what Paul was separated in connection with making manifest. Mm -hmm. right, now go, go to Colossians chapter 1. I want to show you this and we'll be done. Psalm 89 said that Christ was deemed to be the firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Right, he was going to have a possession and a power and an inheritance on earth in connection with that suffering. But Paul comes along and he's going to make manifest something. He says, I've been separated in connection with that involves that redemption work of Christ and what accrues to him because of that that was unknown to prophecy. Let's begin here in Colossians 1 verse 13. He says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. His dear Son, right? The Son of God. In whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Right? Firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, the revelation of the mystery brought into a manifest state some knowledge of the Son of God that prophecy did not foresee or that did not, did not speak to. Right? In the holy scriptures that the prophets spoke about, what God had promised back there, it was known and it was declared that the Messiah that comes into the world, he's going to die according to the scriptures and rise again according to the scriptures, and he's going to be made the firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. He's going to reign on earth in a kingdom, a Davidic kingdom, over all nations, and he's going to be honored and glorified in the earth. Israel's going to be exalted in him. But what was unknown to prophecy, hidden in that cross and that redemption work, is what Paul calls the mystery concerning Christ. A mystery revelation where God shows a secret that he'd been keeping in himself. That he says on the basis of that redemption work. What he's done. He's been raised up. I've declared him to be the son of God with power. He's got the power to bestow redemption. That's going to lead to his power and his inheritance in the kingdom according to prophecy. But also he's not just... Firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. He's not just going to be king of kings and lord of lords in this earth. But he's the firstborn from the dead of every creature. Yeah. He's going to have all authority and power. Not just in the earthly realm. But in the heavenly realm. Whether it's principalities or powers. Or thrones or dominions. All of it was created for him. He's redeemed it all. And according to this mystery it's made manifest. That Christ is going to be the firstborn of every creature. Every creature, not just earth, but heavenly places also. The visible things, the authorities on earth, he's going to be the Lord of. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. But so it shall be in, in, the, in the invisible things created in heavenly places, revealed by the mystery of Christ. Paul says, that's what I've been separated in connection with. That's what's been given to me. I've been made a minister of it. Even the mystery which have been kept hid from ages and from generations... He says, and it's been committed unto me to fulfill the word of God. I'm going to give you the full information of what God's purposed in his son. What that cross was all about. What he was purchasing. What he redeemed to himself. And the inheritance that accrues to the one of whom he says, this is my son. is not just the glory and the inheritance of the earth. 
But he's going to be the firstborn of every creature that in all things he might have the preeminence. The preeminence. And in him all fullness dwells. He's the firstborn from the dead. The preeminent one of every creature. Declared to be the son of God in relation to all that by the resurrection. To Christ, whose son is he? He's the son of God. He's the son of God by his conception. God manifest in the flesh. He's the son of God by his election. The perfect servant who did always the father's will in his life. But he's also the son of God by his resurrection. Having been raised with the authority and power to bestow redemption benefits for all those that will be taken into his kingdom to behold his glory and his honor and inheritance forever and ever and ever, both in earth and in heavenly places. Glorious Savior. The manifold wisdom of God. Paul said to God, only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for the time tonight. We thank you for the truths of Scripture that exalt your Son. And we thank you, Lord, for how that we can see the living word here in the written word. And the master plan of the ages that you designed in yourself before the foundation of the world to give him all honor and glory and praise. And Father, we know that because we're in him, we're going to be made partaker of his inheritance also. Lord, we don't deserve that. It's only in your grace and mercy that you would even think on us, much less make us part of that. But the Apostle Paul says that it's not entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And it's all made possible through the cross work, the redeeming power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood and the fact that he was raised again for our justification. We give you the thanks and praise and glory for you alone are worthy. In Christ's name, amen.